Today, we're in one of the world's guitar holy spots, Nazareth, Pennsylvania, the Martin Factory Museum. And through these doors, and I can't even believe the guitars I'm about to play, and it's made me wonder, is there an inherent magic in certain instruments? Let's head in, find out. What's the most valuable thing you've ever held in your hands? For me, it's gonna be this guitar, which has real <laughs> diamonds encrusted all over it. Uh, it's rumored that this guitar is worth somewhere in the seven figures. It is the two million five hundred guitar that Martin ever made. And all these diamonds represent the uh, celestial bodies in the sky on the day that the original Chris Martin landed in New York City. So if he'd looked up, he would have seen this set of constellations. There's a ruby on a map of Manhattan on the pit guard right here, which represents where he landed. It's so cool. There's a boat made of pearl maybe inside here, which I'm guessing is the boat that he took over here. There's a house, which would have been his house, I guess. Of all the ones around here, this is one of the ones that stands out because this was Grandpa owned by Kurt Cobain as well as Elliot Smith. There's a picture, which I've seen a million times, of Kurt Cobain playing a guitar up there. And this is the guitar that he plays in there. So I feel like if any guitar in this whole museum has magic, it's gotta be this one. And so I gotta be honest, I'm not really a big Kurt Cobain guy. Not really a big Elliot Smith guy, but my man Sean <laughs> Daniel here. This guitar I know means a lot. This is the one right here. This is the best guitar in the entire Martin Museum. I did a performance of Say Yes with this on my channel, and I was shaking when I was I was so nervous because Elliot Smith is like the goat in my estimation. Want to know and, something about Elliot Smith? So yeah. <laughs> and I thought I thought Elliot Smith was a member of the Smiths. But it gets worse. I thought the Smiths were the cure. In my mind, oh my for years I was thinking like you were talking about Elliot Smith. I'm like, oh yeah, he's the guy from the cure. And I thought the cure was named the Smiths. Yeah, Elliot so Smith is not in the cure, <laughs> nor is he Robert Smith, but uh, he's actually a pretty next level songwriter. Okay, so everybody knows the Gibson Les Paul, but did you know that Les Paul's first quality guitar was actually a Martin? which is an 018K, that according to the plaque that's in the museum here, this is the guitar that he was like learning how to play jazz on. And if you notice, it's got numbers that he wrote all along the fretboard here, so I guess like he could figure out how to play, which is pretty cool to think about that. Like a young Les Paul, one of the pioneers of all things guitar, sat in his bedroom and learned how to play on this very guitar. Okay, so this one, 1942, Martin D45, known as the Holy Grail, not just because like this was the highest end instrument that was made in 42, but those guitars from that era are some of the most renowned acoustic guitars ever in the history of acoustic guitars. I don't know if it's gonna come across perfectly through the camera mic, but like that's probably the best sounding acoustic guitar I've ever heard in my life. All right, I'll quickly let you know that the Back to School sale is going on for a limited time over my course platform, SamuraiGuitar3.com, where I teach my system for making music. You can get the complete Samurai Guitar 3 experience. All my courses bundled together for as cheap as I've ever sold them. When you use promo code Back to School 23 at checkout, you can find more information at SamuraiGuitar3.com. I've also got a links in the description. Anyways, let's get back to it. This is the two millionth guitar that Martin made. So it has serial number two million and it's made to commemorate the passing of time. Everything about this is kind of, you know, a clock. It's got the gears of a clock all throughout it. It's super cool that you see like the actual gear in here, but then as part of the, uh, the inlay here, it's that the gear continued. You have the innards of a clock throughout the fingerboard. You have an actual working clock up here. Like these tuning machines are unlike anything else I've ever seen. It's remarkably heavy. It's as much a piece of art as it is a guitar. This is the oldest 
Martin guitar in this museum, uh, coming in and being birthed at 1834, which is like maybe 200 years ago. It's a, I guess what we would call a classical guitar that is quite unlike a lot of the stuff we would see now, but this is kind of the history of, of guitars right here. Um, what stands out to me with this one is just like the weird placement of these tuning machines up here and this crazy mechanism back here. And also like how ornate that is. Like you would think when it comes to early instruments, they would be less fancy. But I mean, you look at this thing and it's like completely beautiful. You wonder what was played on here in its existence. Who played this thing? What's been put into this instrument? Nineteen forty-seven D eighteen owned by the original Hank Williams, not Hank Williams Jr. or Junior Jr. or whatever iteration of Hank Williams Rod now. The hillbilly Shakespeare would have bought this brand new in nineteen forty-seven before playing it for years and eventually, I guess, giving it or selling it to one of his friends, one of the uh, most important influential figures in all of country music. Played some of the most important influential songs in all of country music through this guitar here. This is a 1942 Martin, which on its own is quite cool, but what makes this like remarkably cool and a fascinating piece of history is the fact that it's got this thing here. And what this is, this is Leo Fender of Fender fame's first attempt at electrifying a guitar, at least as far as we know. So he would have bought this Martin, I guess in the 40s, probably when it was close to new, put this on here and this is before Fender existed. This is before electric guitars existed. Like this is the, the one of the birthplaces of this thing that's had such a huge impact on like everything we do as musicians and guitar players. Do you ever really take a second and think like how cool some of these things are? Every time I do get to strum one of these uh, amazing instruments, it reminds me how, how great they are and how lucky I am, that's for sure. Yeah, it's something really cool. It's history sitting in front of you. And it's a little bit weird when it's in front of you, I think, because a lot of the times when you see it on a TV screen or you see it on the internet or you see it wherever, you're just thinking like it's, it's something different and special and all, it's not even real. But then you sit with it and you're like, oh yeah, it is just a guitar, but it's not just a guitar. And it's like two things working together at the same time that's hard to kind of process. Next we're doing uh, the Waylon Jennings D28 from 1946. It almost like feels like it's got like sweat marks there that I don't even want to touch. Like it looks like there's like dried sweat all around there. Do you see that? Oh, nasty. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's Waylon sweat. If you pick up a guitar, do you have to play the songs that... The... Well, that was like Waylon-esque, but um, I don't know, like one of my natural instincts is yeah, to like go towards something that would be like, make sense with the mojo of the guitar. Like I'm not gonna pick this up and be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, that's not where I first go, but. Does it feel weird to do that? Did you play Master Exploder just then? No, that was my oh. attempt at playing Crazy Train. No, I got to wrong. Okay. <laughs> this song sounds just like that. So this, uh, Rory, what's the deal with this one? This is F7 1937, which is looking like we're starting to get into electric guitar world here but it's not. So why did they make these? Do you know? I mean, it was an arch top because that was what was popular at the time, right? And during uh, you know, the, the jazz that was popular in the 30s, that was really pop music, right, in all the ways. No, so, like Charlie Christian. Yeah, all uh, the big band stuff. Freddie right? Green, I think. Oh, Freddie Green, yeah, playing thirds and sevenths, right? But you know, the rhythm guitar. What's important in Martin history on this one would be that that's where we got our M or quadruple O body size from. So eventually we put a flat top on that and came things like the M36 or the M38. Joan Baez guitar. Um, I'm not the biggest Joan Baez fan, but like I know of her impact. Ooh. Oh. 
That's nice. What do you think of this one? Yeah, the thing is, that was amazing. That's from 1882, by the way. Yeah, she was a legendary folk artist. I don't know a ton about her. But instantly picking this one up, like this one stands out a lot to me. It's got a thin neck, but a V shape to it. But it just rings out, oh my goodness. This one stands out to me like quite a bit. But I don't think it's the magic that Joan Baez played. I think it's the magic that this is just like a great guitar, like a great instrument. So check this out, how cool is this? So this was a, or this is a set list that was written by her. <laughs> So I've played some really cool guitars today, like the coolest guitars I've ever played, um, and I find myself thinking back to that original question, like is there magic in these things? And I don't think there's like something special that happens when somebody famous or legendary plays an instrument and just like injects part of what made them special into the instrument. I don't think that's a thing. Um, but what I do think is so cool about these things is as soon as you pick one of the, those up, you start thinking about it differently. Like you start playing things that you wouldn't normally play, knowing that it was used by Kurt Cobain or Elliot Smith or Waylon Jennings or Hank Williams or whoever. You just think differently about that in a way that you just never could simulate that experience if it wasn't, if you didn't know that those guys picked it up. And I think that's what's magical. It's magical seeing what somebody who uh, grew up worshiping the person who played that guitar, how they feel about it. That is to me quite a magical, cool thing, more so than I personally have felt towards any of these guitars. I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's something cool. I think that's something special and in ways, I guess that would be considered magical. And so with all that said, the biggest thank yous to Rory, Floyd, and the team at Martin for having us out here. This has been a really cool experience being able to do this. It's something that I'm truly grateful for. Thank you guys for watching. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell. Stay tuned for a wide range of music related content. Until next time, look after yourselves, look after each other, look after the planet. I'm Sam Ray, guitarist. I'll see you again soon. Good. Yeah. Nice one.